Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, February 12th, 2019. I'm your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brains. We have a reasonably exciting news day and following today's news today is going to be a special extended episode building on yesterday's discussion on UNESCO and how it interrelates to astronomy. Thank you so much Larry Weird and Proud for making this suggestion or at least for suggesting UNESCO. Now, uh, today's news is filled with things on the move. And in fact, the first thing on the move that we're going to discuss, discuss, wow, can't speak today. The first thing that we're going to discuss is uh, the spacecraft MAVEN and how it is going to be adjusting its orbit in the coming months to prepare itself for the Mars 2020 rover's approach. The spacecraft that we put into orbit around Mars serve a whole variety of different purposes. Their primary mission, of course, is to accomplish science. From Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to the or earlier Mars Odyssey to today's MAVEN spacecraft, each of these different vehicles has the capacity to communicate with rovers on the surface and then relay those signals back to Earth and vice versa to accept commands relayed from Earth and then send those down to the spacecraft. Now, in the case of MAVEN, its initial orbit has its art, has it going around Mars at a fairly significant distance that is designed to allow it to study the outermost parts of Mars orbit. Not Mars orbit, the outermost parts of Mars atmosphere. In order for it to be able to better communicate with the Mars 2020 rover when it gets there, well, sometime in late Mars 2020 uh, or early Mars 2021, depending on how the launch window progresses. Um, well, for that to happen, we're going to need to adjust its orbit. Now, the way that we're doing this requires us to break Mar to break Maven. And thank you, Uncle Bill, for hosting over the stream. Now, when I say we need to break Maven, I don't mean that we need to go out there with sledgehammers and pound on the spacecraft. What I mean is we're going to be applying the brakes and slowing the spacecraft down in its orbit. If you slow a spacecraft at just the right place in its orbit, the next time it goes around, it won't get as far away from the red planet as it usually does. Thank you, Guido, for the sub. Thank you so much. Um, so here we're going to see them actually using that atmosphere of Mars that MAVEN is designed to study to not just produce science results, but to make future science possible with Mars 2020. They'll be doing a deep dive into the atmosphere, accomplishing a little bit of science as they go, and using the atmosphere of Mars to slow them down and to slow them effectively into a new significantly lower orbit. This future orbit is going to cause them to get just 4,500 kilometers away from the surface at its furthest point um, and is going to shorten its orbital period. This means it'll be overhead for the rover more often and the signal strength can be a little bit weaker even when it's furthest away and it'll still be able to hear the little rover on the surface. Assuming all goes well, assuming all goes well, never count your spacecraft before they've returned first signal. Now, in other news of things on the move, we have a tale of stars gone wild. In this case, one of the young forming stars in the Orion Star Forming Nebula has been observed to give off a flare of light that is, well, to say it's bright is kind of an understatement. For a period of several hours, the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope and its Scuba 2 instrument operating down in Hawaii were able to observe, um, well, to observe a planet, not a planet, to observe a forming star giving off a flare of light 
that was 10 billion times brighter than any of the brightest flares or coronal mass ejections we've seen from our own sun. This is the kind of thing that if pointed towards a planet, just like life is over. It's just that simple. Life is over on that world. Now, as I said, this did occur in a young star system where the star is still forming. We are still discovering just how violent baby stars can be. And lucky for us, it turns out that life probably evolves a little bit later in solar system formation. So looking at this system, well, kudos to the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope and SCUBA 2 for making this detection. This is one of those amazing things where they had to have the right instrument on the right telescope pointed in the right direction at the right time. As I said, this particular event only lasted a few hours. Had it occurred during daytime in Hawaii, we would never have seen, again, this event that was 10 billion times more powerful than a solar flare observed from our sun. Space is an awful big thing. The sky is huge. Details like this are easy to miss if they're rare. And we still don't know how many rare and unexpected things are waiting to be discovered. And this is why we so look forward to the completion of instruments and telescopes like the upcoming Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. So now we know stars are more violent than previously thought. In other news of early solar system violence, we now look at models about the formation of worlds like our own Earth. It's believed that when the Earth formed, the young sun was hot enough and bright enough that most of the water on our planet was initially baked off. Now, that meant that our oceans had to come from somewhere. And the somewhere that scientists like to blame is small. Well, we're using the word planetesimals nowadays because we're not sure what the contributions were from comets, what the contributions were from asteroids. Whatever you want to name those small bits of stuff that brought us the water, it it is a lucky thing that we were baked dry before they brought that water to us. New models are showing that if a, sol if a planet in a baby solar system is still wet when the moisture, the new moisture is brought by all of these planetesimals, there's a chance that you'll get a complete global ocean. And that global ocean has the potential to form a layer of ice down at the base. This is complicated physics. I have to admit, I don't fully understand all of the models yet. This is a new paper that's coming out in Nature Astronomy from researchers from Planet S. And um, this is the National Center of Competence in Research, Planet S in Switzerland. Um, this, if they are able to form a deep ocean layer of ice that compresses the world, that ice may prevent um, the kinds of geothermal processes that now keep us nice and warm and happy. Now, the other thing that's at play is just how did we get all of the radioactive materials that we have? Our own planet isn't radiating energy way away and cooling off as fast as you would expect unless you include heat produced, produced within our world through the decay of nuclear particles. Our world is rich in uranium, plutonium, thorium, all these other things that undergo long-term nuclear decay. And each of these have lives expended, release new heat into our world's well, interior. They also release particles that if you have a granite foundation or are on granite bedrock can lead to radon building up in your basement. So get your basement basement checked for radiation. Whether or not you have radon, our world has these radioactive processes taking place. Our world has internal heat generating mechanisms. And this means our world is warm on the inside. The new models that are coming out of Switzerland, in looking at 
Well, just how do you get a wet world like Earth? They, they take into consideration both the existence of the radiative elements, the amount that may have come to us on these planetesimals that brought the water, and they take into consideration how our water, how our planet may have been baked dry, not just by this early sun, but also through radioactive decay early in our planet's history. By combining all of these different details, they come to two conclusions. One, our planet was probably baked dry by the early sun, working in concert with aluminum uh, 26 isotopes that underwent nuclear decay. By baking our planet dry early on, planetesimals were able to bring us further water and other minerals and stuff and things that re-watered our world, allowing us to have the geothermal processes we have today, as well as the oceans we have today. When these things all happen together, it leads us to understand that one of the keys to life may be baking a world really dry with radiation and young stars prior to terraforming it, well, with incoming planetesimals. That's what those planetesimals really did. By bringing us water, they terraformed our world. So thank you, rocks, for everything you did when you fell out of the sky. Now, that pretty much concludes today's science. I'm going to answer questions for a little while, and then I had promised you yesterday that I'd do a deep dive into UNESCO. And so I'm going to do that. Now, while you're typing those questions in, I'm going to remind you, please, 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 at CosmoQuestX and make it easier for me to find your questions. While you're typing those in, I'm also going to remind you that the Daily Space is a creation of CosmoQuest. We are produced by the Planetary Science Institute, working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. We are here most Mondays through Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern. That is 10 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. London time. Now, when I say most Mondays through Fridays, it's because occasionally things come up. And tomorrow we're going to be starting 15 minutes late. But we're starting 15 minutes late for a reason. I'm going to be attending a quick web seminar that is going to allow me to catch up on research that other folks are doing on using machine learning to identify craters on other worlds. One of our hopes with CosmoQuest is to use your data, already input for numerous worlds in our solar system, to help train machine learning algorithms to, well, map the rest of the worlds for us. So I'm going to fill my brain with science so I can turn your data into new science. And I'm going to start 15 minutes late because of it. So tomorrow, tune in at 1.15 Eastern, 10.15 a.m. Pacific, that's 6.15 London time. And yes, I will put up a screen to let you all know in the morning. So, okay, pulling up the questions and seeing what you all have to say. Finding the window I put the questions in first. There we go. So, um, scrolling back. Um, so, Ruffs Matt says, if MAVEN is going to be the relay for Mars 2020, is the contemporaneous Ursula Franklin rover, Ursula? I think you mean Rosalind Franklin. Um, Rosalind Franklin rover also going to need a relay like Mars Express to communicate with Earth. Um, I don't actually know the details of what they're going to be doing with the Russell and Franklin's rover. Um, the Franklin rover being built by the European Space Agency is set to use to take advantage of the exact same launch window that the Mars 2020 rover is going to be taking advantage of. Um, the European Space Agency has planned on using their spacecraft as relays, but they haven't successfully landed something on the surface yet. Um, Beagle kind of went smush when it got there so many years ago. Um, this is something I'm going to have to learn up more about. So how about next week I do a deep dive into the 2020 launch window to Mars and what all we're planning to do to take advantage of it. Um, so let's see what other questions we have in here. Hanny is asking, how would the planet radiate heat if there is an ice shell under the water? 
Uh, so, so one of the things that they get at, and again, I haven't been able to get my hands on the paper yet. Um, one of the things that they get at is you won't have the same radioactive processes necessarily if you have a smaller core, if you're coated in all of this much water. Um, and so it's a feedback mechanism. I need to read more before I can answer with more than just hand wavy. They have it taken care of in their model. Um, bear with me. I'm going to get there. Um, so let's see what other questions. So Hanny also goes on to ask, how much water is in an asteroid? Was there more water in them in the past? So, so one of the, the words that I used was planetesimals. And this is because the these small objects in our solar system come in a variety of different formats. You have uh, mostly icy bodies that are made of volatiles, water ice, carbon dioxide ice, other ices. Uh, these often are visited to us in the form of comets. Uh, we're still learning what else out in the Kuiper belt. Uh, these are primarily not rock. We also have asteroids, which exist in our nearby solar system, that tend to be mostly rock, we think. But then we look at things like, well, Ceres, and we realize, oh, expletive, these things might have subsurface oceans. Uh, and then, of course, there's the things like uh, uh, Bennu and um, Ryugu that we're visiting with the Hayabusa and OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. These appear to be solid rocks and metals. Um, so it all depends on which planetesimal you look at. The, the proportion of rock to ice appears to go from completely ice to completely rock with everything in between being a possibility. And we just don't know uh, what the average is as a function of the size of the asteroid or comet or whatever you want to call the thing. Um, the universe is full of diverse and amazing objects. So Space Cowboy 75 says, does that mean that the Earth's core is much smaller than they thought? Um, the early or Earth's core might have been. So here's the thing. Our planet's a weirdo. Our planet underwent a massive collision early in its history. A smaller version of Earth and a roughly Mars-sized object named Thea, because why not name it, uh, collided three and a half-ish billion years ago. And the result of this collision was an extremely dense planet, the Earth that we live on, as well as a lower density moon that was made of splashed lower density materials from the collision. So when you take two planetesimals, smoosh them together, and you keep the high density stuff on one world, Earth, and the lower density stuff on another object, the moon, you end up with a weird situation. So had we been more normal, had we not undergone this collision, we would have had a smaller core. We would have had lower density materials, a much more massive crust. Who knows what other differences may have been out there. Um, we're still figuring these things out. But yes, there would have been a smaller core in the past. Um, let's see. So Archie Haddock is asking uh, regarding 2014 MU69. And the reason I'm using that name instead of Ultimate Thule is it's it was realized that that was a name that is often used by neo-nazis and other um pro-aryan nation individuals um in their literature and rather than inadvertently cause emotional harm while trying to celebrate science i'm just going to use its uh, official designation rather than its nickname the official designation is 2014 mu69 um, so what is it and what is up with the shape? Well, what it is, is a Kuiper belt object that may be untouched by collisional processes. What this means is a bunch of space debris left over during the formation of planets early in our solar system, slowly and gradually over time, spiraled together to form two essentially pancakes in the plane of our galaxy. So you can imagine this as an eddy 
not galaxy, in, a, in the plane of our solar system. So you can imagine this as two small eddies in the early solar system. And these eddies formed into two disks, and these disks smooshed into each other. And that smooshed together disk is 2014 MU69. And it is quite possible that since its formation, this two splatted together pancake pair just hasn't interacted with anything else. And um, thus we're looking at just leftover remains of, well, how our solar system was built. Um, so Henny goes on to ask, uh, does this data mean that Venus was once as wet as Earth? Well, this data doesn't tell us that, but prior data, prior studies that we've done of Venus does lead us to believe that Venus once was as wet as Earth. However, uh, due to its massive temperature, all of that water would have evaporated into water vapor and that underwent additional chemical processes leading to us having a world that has all the constituents of water but put together into other things that include stuff like sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. All the elements are there just rearranged into more deadly molecules. Um, so the Raven Lillian is asking, is Mars still eating spacecraft at the same rate or are we getting better at sending things there? We are indeed getting better at sending things there. Now, to be fair, um, not a lot of nations have tried to land on the red planet recently. Um, we have had an Indian spacecraft fly there. Um, we did uh, have our own Curiosity, Mars Insight. Um, but landings, eh, there haven't been that many attempts. So I'm not sure how to discuss long-term trends um, when we're not trying as often as we used to. Um, yes, what Binary Ablaze is saying about the official name won't be Ultima Thule, Thulu for, MU, for 2014 MU69 is entirely correct. So might as well just wait for the IAU to give us an official designation. Um, so let's see. Um, safe spaces for life is hard, Paranor. It's true. It's true. And Mars does like to eat spacecraft. <sighs> it is the way it is. So while I see a pause in the questions, I'm going to switch topics and I'm going to bring you... Oh, actually, while we're on MU69, 2014 MU69, um, I actually have opened in a window I can share uh, some tweets that were posted earlier today. That did not go as planned. Hold on. I clicked the wrong button and the window moved instead of sharing. Let's try this again. Um, so let's click transition. There we go. So earlier today, Roman, Roman Tachenko, and apologies to Roman for how I just destroyed your last name, uh, began to share some of his reprocessing of the data that New Horizons has sent back to us for 2014 MU69. Here we see his, uh, the way he phrases it is, an attempt to improve the best image yet of Ultima Thule. Not the best way to do things since he has no raw image, but anyways. Um, so this is his reprocessing of the JPEGs that have been released. Now, he also went through and has been working on reprocessing um, the moons of Pluto as imaged by New Horizons a couple of years ago. Here he does have access to the original images and as a hobbyist he has time and in some cases better software than the professionals in order to do these recreations. Uh, here in this image, and let me see what I can do to zoom in on this. So there we go. Um, so here we have um, reprocessed images of Pluto's moon Nix. These are the two different faces from two different images. Um, and here is a reprocessed image of Pluto's moon Hydra. 
So we are starting to see the solar system, or at least the outermost bits of the solar system, in more and more data, thanks to the volunteer efforts of folks like Roman. Um, you can go ahead and give him a follow. I will put his Twitter info into the chat. Yes, disillusioned. Enhance, enhance, enhance. Um, he has figured out how to do that with great deftness. Now, what I was here to talk about is actually um, how we are studying the history of astronomy on our world and protecting, well, protecting the future of astronomy as well. UNESCO is a government body that um, allows us to protect various things across the earth for future generations. The UNESCO World Heritage Foundation is focused in four different ways on protecting monuments and sites. These are tangible objects in fixed locations. They're also working to collect instruments and artifacts in museums often. These are tangible objects that are capable of being moved and being protected. There are also intangible things that we're working to protect. This is the cultural knowledge and ideas of various peoples around the world that can be captured in recordings, in um, documentation, and just passing the stories from one generation to another. And finally, and this is new within just the past 10 years. The idea of doing this was put forward in 2009, voted on in 2018, and made real. And this is the idea of protecting natural landscapes and skies for future generations. Or rather than being passed in 2018, I should say we've been having the locations authorized under the, the guidelines put forward in 2009, named in 2018. So here we have astronomical sites that are being protected, artifacts that are being protected, stories that are being protected, as well as dark, si dark sky reservations. Now, it is possible for you to go out and explore information on all of these things that we're working on protecting through the portal to Heritage in, Astro in Astronomy. And I will also share this content with you. Now, all of this work is being done by the United Nations, working in collaborations with the International Astronomical Union. Um, here you can see that this is the portal to the Astronomy and World Heritage Initiative coming out of UNESCO that is working with the Working Group on Astronomy and World Heritage. This is part of Commission C out of the International Astronomical Union and for, for, and for full disclosure, I'm an officer um, on the steering committee for Commission C. Um, I am not part of this particular working group. Now, what they've been working on doing is defining what is world heritage within the context of astronomical heritage. What are the kinds of places that need protecting? Are they strictly the um, elder statesmen of the community? Places like, well, Stonehenge, which is globally recognized. Um, or do they also include more modern places, such as Greenwich Observatory? Uh, how do we do case studies to help define what are the places that perhaps should be protected? So here we have different case studies. Um, one of the most interesting places to me is the uh, Jantar Mantar at Juniper, India. This is a proposed World Heritage Site that is an amazing landscape of astronomical instruments that were put together by a ruler of India and can still be explored today. This is the heritage that we have and don't always talk about and that we need to protect against the encroachments of development and war. 
Now, I'm not worried about war in India, but you have to worry about development everywhere. Now, with all of these different efforts, this is largely done through combinations of national funds and through the massive volunteer efforts of astronomers, archaeologists, politicians all around the world to put together these various case studies that help to define, well, is this a World Heritage Site? What cultural significance does it have? This can all be downloaded. This is all put here free for the public consumption. Now, when we look at what all is going on, Larry yesterday put out the idea of can projects like CosmoQuest go to UNESCO to seek funding? Well, the truth is that it takes money for us to protect World Heritage Sites. And the United Nations isn't exactly an organization that is running with cash, rather, um, it's UNESCO that is asking for your help, your help in protecting to save our world for future generations. Among the dark heritage sites, these are the kinds of places like there is uh, St. John's outside of Christchurch. There is a dark sky preserve in Portugal near the Spanish border. There are, well, new heritage sites being defined around the world for all these different purposes. We don't often think of the dark skies as being the kind of thing that needs to be protected, but it turns out that dark skies are a limited resource as human beings spread more and more across our planet they're taking electricity with them they're lighting up the night sky and this light these photons compete with the photons of the most distant stars and galaxies of our universe if your neighborhood gas station glows too brightly we'll never understand star formation so in creating these dark sky preserves we're making sure there is a place in our world that we can continue to do science and more than that because we can always launch spacecraft that have telescopes on board more than that we're creating places where you can take your children or somebody else's children i'm a fan of borrowing kids now and then with permission um you can take children and show them the night sky and help them understand where the world word Milky Way comes from. A kid raised in a city may only see a dozen stars on any given night if they're lucky. To take them someplace where the stars are so numerous that it is beyond the human capacity to count, that is something that every human should have the opportunity to do. And thanks to UNESCO, hopefully every human for future generations to come will have that ability. So this is what UNESCO is up to as we work to protect the monuments, the artifacts, the culture, and the skies that all together tell the story of how we have studied astronomy and how we will continue to study astronomy into the future. And that was our deep dive for today. And I'm going to look and see, do you have any more cool questions um, off in the chat? You have donuts. You have donuts. I now want donuts too. And thank you for lighting everything up for Rocket Sage. Um, hooray for learning. Can we get a shout out for Rocket Sage? She is another uh, science streamer. She is part of the Brainy Bites team, just like CosmoQuest, and one of the leaders over at um, the Knowledge Fellowship, T TKF, which is a Discord that supports streamers and viewers all trying to use Twitch to learn together. And when I say Rocket, I mean rock as in geology. She's a geologist. So, um, yeah, go science.
Okay, looking for questions. Hanny is saying, what are some movable instruments that they are protecting? There is an amazing library of instruments at Harvard that happens to just be the one I'm most familiar with because I worked in the same building for a while. And the kinds of things that they have are Thomas Cook's telescope that was used. Thank you for the bits, Kaymore. Thank you so much. Um, so the kinds of things that they have are things like Thomas Cook's telescope that was used to study the first Venus transit that was observed scientifically. They have the instruments used by Eddington when he observationally um, studied uh, relativity, proving that Einstein's theories had observational data to back them up. It's these instruments that have been used for key moments to do science. Um, I'm sure there's others. Those are just the ones that are currently coming to mind. Um, so let's see what else. Geology does rock in every possible way. Geologists are also why CosmoQuest has the rule, do not lick the science, because geologists lick rocks, and it's a bit disturbing. Um, OK. Uh, and, and that is true, the gem doctor, that is true. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, I, I'm out. I've got no retort to that. No response, nothing. I am out. Um, yeah, and when we finally get to Mars, do not lick the science. There's perchlorates there. They'll kill you. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how good they'll taste. I think mostly they'll taste like rust. Anyways, I, I have work to do, and I'm not seeing new questions coming in. So once again, I would like to remind all of you that the daily space is part of CosmoQuest. We are here to help you learn and do science. We are part of the Planetary Science Institute, and um, we are here to help you um, know more about our solar system. We are working in collaboration with Youngstown State University and we are here most Mondays through Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, that is 6 p.m. London time. Tomorrow, however, is one of the days when uh, we're not going to be here at those times. Tomorrow we're going to start 15 minutes late so I can go fill my head with creator science. Thank you, Rosen AJ, for the bits. Let's light up the chat for those bits. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kaymore, for the bits. Thank you so very much. Um, you guys are awesome. As always, give us a follow. Follows are free and will help you know when our content goes live. Uh, we don't just do the daily space. We also bring you spacecraft launches, landings, press conferences, and other special events as they happen. We provide you an opportunity to keep track of all that is new and awesome in space and astronomy. We also have Sunday Science Hour with our own Annie Wilson and um, new shows will be coming as, as time and finances allow. Speaking of finances, we are here because of you. Your subscriptions sustain us and every bit really counts now more than ever. We, like so many scientists, are trying to figure out how to deal with uh, federal government funding irregularities. We're going to go with the word irregularities today. And um, you make it possible for us to keep going. So thank you for supporting us. And thank you for, as you do that, supporting science and keeping the science going. Thank you. Thank you. I am so grateful to have all of you here to lift us up and help us do science. So wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, afternoon. If the weather allows, go outside and look up.